Hello and welcome to the FMCC's World FM Day Celebration. We are, our presentation right today is going to be FM Service Management, Technology Essentials for Each Generation. And our presenters today are Jeff Williams, Ted Ritter, and Laura Spitak. I do want to let everyone know they have been muted for audio quality and that this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be provided at a later date and it will be posted to the FMCC website, which is fmcc.fma.org. If you do have any questions during this webinar, please feel free and type them into the question box and we'll review them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ted, Jeff, and Laura. The floor is yours. Thank you, Josh, and thanks for joining us today. Happy World FM Day. Uh, we're at uh, 10 a.m. Central Time on May 16th. Um, we're uh, basically re repurposing some content we shared at uh, Facility Fusion in Chicago. Um, I, I think uh, we had a very interactive two-hour session that could have gone uh, quite a bit longer. Uh, between the three of us, it was a great audience, and um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to you know, replicate some of those dynamics uh, even though we'll have less interaction with uh, those of you that are online with us today. So I always like to uh, uh, spend a moment talking about the importance of councils and communities. Um, you know, we're organized into 16 verticals, uh, you know, that are you know, typically around, uh, you know, a specific sector of, of the marketplace, um, airports or bank or corporate or uh, utilities. And, you know, that gives you an opportunity to uh, network with uh, like peers uh, across many geographies. Uh, communities are really more horizontally organized and provide content and thought leadership uh, that really support uh, our core competencies. Uh, Jeff and I have been with uh, uh, the technology community for uh, more years than we'd like to really admit to, and very happy to have uh, Laura with us today as well. Um, I, you know, I think our, our primary mission is that we want to collaborate and answer the same question multiple different ways, which is, you know, how does technology support um, and, uh, infrastructure and facility management in general? And uh, we collaborate with other communities, chapters, and really look for best practice case studies to share. Uh, we present, uh, you know, quite a few uh, events around the world, and as well as uh, producing six to eight webinars a year. Uh, just to look back to uh, last year, I think Jeff's going to point out that I, I probably missed a couple, but uh, we were uh, represented at uh, most of the major IFMA events as well as uh, quite a few regional events in North America. Uh, so, you know, we're very active and uh, I think very collaborative in terms of, you know, how we approach things. Um, one of the things that we did put together uh, with our um, uh, partners with uh, GEFMA, the German Facility Management Association, uh, is the Facility Manager's Guide for Information Technology. Um, we started this process, I think, uh, you know, almost 12, 14 years ago. Uh, we uh, remastered uh, into the second edition last year. We launched that, uh, I think, at uh, World Workplace in Houston. We had a nice book signing. Um, it's a great reference tool and really, you know, uh, designed to uh, be kind of a, a good resource guide. Uh, for working facility managers, as well as uh, you know, a, a good resource for uh, universities with FM programs. So uh, thanks again for attending the webinar. You can uh, find a copy of the book on Amazon if you're interested. Um, last minute uh, slide here is, uh, I think, in terms of uh, you know, some really good information on um, ISO. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, there's uh, an email you can uh, certainly get in touch with Laverne, or you can go to the ISO.org home. I think it, it, it's really important to uh, you know, make sure that we understand that there are now global standards that, quite frankly, didn't exist um, you know, a few years ago. Um, outline for today. Uh, just going to talk about our format a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about types of stakeholder-facing FM technologies. Um, we, you know, we're going to have to have some consideration and thought process on device formats. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about hospitality and, and how the philosophy of hospitality is, is migrating into the uh, facility management world and, and how we uh, you know, operate our, our facilities and how we interact with, with our customers. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about challenges. A good part of that, I think, will be, uh, you know, certainly between the three of us, but I think we'll, you know, uh, we'll call some things that we've heard from uh, fusion in Chicago, 
Um, we'll talk briefly about you know how to develop a, a flexible FM strategy, and you know how do we really you know, deal with process mapping to different technology platforms. Really, you know, kind of a lot of change management involved. It's it's you know. Uh, just a kind of fact of life that so, so the technology is, is changing uh, so rapidly. I'm uh, going to wrap up with uh, you know, addressing privacy concerns, GDPR, uh, general data protection requirements uh, goes into effect on uh, May 25th in Europe, and that's already affecting how we uh, really need to think about uh, uh, how we interact with uh, our, our customers, um, you know, online, uh, even in uh, the U.S. and those uh, same. Uh, requirements are, are definitely going to be coming here next year, so it's something we all need to keep an eye out for. Um, a, a quick background on myself. Um, uh, as I said, I've been with the uh, technology community for quite some time. Uh, past president of the Phoenix chapter, uh, serve on the uh, America's Advisory Board, and uh, co-author of uh, Facility Manager's Guide to Information Technology. Jeff, I think I'll hand it off to you and Laura to talk a little bit more. Hey, well, I've I've also been in the uh, involved in the information technology community since probably the beginning of time. Uh, it feels like um, I was 12 when I joined, and uh, I've held every role, including uh, the the coveted chair role that Ted has uh, graciously ascended to at this point. Uh, I've been actively involved in IFMA, uh, chapter leader, um, and also global board director uh, for three years. So. Uh, really passionate about the facility management community and looking forward to the chat today. Laura? Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be with you on World FM Day. I am a facility manager in Cleveland, Ohio for a nonprofit. Um, I've been involved with IFMA for several years now, and I work closely with the Northern Ohio chapter. Excellent. Can we get the next slide, please? All okay, right, so today, it's going to be a little different than the last time we presented it, but um, the idea was that we would seed, uh, seed the audience with a series of content pieces that Ted kind of went through in the outline. And the expectation was is that we'd be happy to have uh, audience interaction, so through, in this case through the chat window, uh, happy to be derailed and talk about the things that you wish to talk about. Um, but to get started, we're going to uh, get into a little bit about who we are uh, from a generational perspective and the technology that we grew up with. And this is a bit of a kind of a learning experience about who Ted is, who Jeff is, and who Laura is from a technology perspective. Next slide, please. So, um, yeah, I'm the boomer in the group, and I, you know, I think when we, you know, kind of came up with this concept, and Jeff, you know, it was a great, great idea is, you know, where did we start with technology? What did we grow up with? And what did the first technology look like that we used in the workplace? So, you know, I grew up with a black and white TV. Uh, I grew up with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> records, 45s and uh, 33 and a third long play. Um, I kind of uh, was, was very fortunate that, you know, I had a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder when I was uh, young, and I was actually able to make uh, playlists. Uh, in the late 60s, which uh, was really cool and cutting edge. As far as, um, you know, my first phone was a brick. Uh, it was as expensive as all get out, but uh, I was uh, kind of in the construction space for a couple of years, and it really made a difference uh, in terms of how to communicate from the field to uh, suppliers or back to the, the shop. Uh, but, you know, that was my first phone. Um, uh, it's as close as we could find to uh, first computer. It was really, really cool. It had a hard drive. It had a whole 10 megs of uh, storage on it, uh, which I think compared to you know what we consider today as a you know reasonable download for a large image file is the entire storage capacity of the PC. So uh, you know that's where I started. I think um, you know we had a lot of interaction from. Uh, the session infusion of, of you, know, you know how many boomers were in the room and how many Gen X and Gen Y and um, uh, it, it caused uh, I think a lot of good conversation. Um, before I move on to uh, uh, you know the Jeff slide, uh, any comments uh, from Jeff or Laura on uh, uh, kind of replaying in our mind what happened in Chicago? Well, I'm, I, I think one of the things that I'll replay is I, I'm still trying to imagine you giving your first girlfriend a mixtape in a, something the size of a pizza box, but uh, but I'm sure it was very amorous. 
Um, I can't say I actually gave a mixtape out to anyone because the tapes were so damn expensive that I had one. So anyway, that, that didn't actually happen. So we'll segue into uh, your your first technology experience with Mr. Williams. Yeah, so I think that the, uh, the one thing that we should probably highlight is that Ted and I um, are probably fairly early adopters of, of technology. And, and I think that that's one of the things that kind of starts to dispel the generational items. Uh, you'll see some of the similar elements in Laura's uh, items to things that I had in high school. But, um, you know, I remember the first phone that uh, that cell phone that came into our family and it was this thing that basically was trunk mounted it took up half the trunk and you got a full-on handset in the car first computer was the vic 20 which was uh uh well it was terrible it uh you recorded your programs on a cassette tape and they would notoriously crash and that's if the cassette tape didn't break or or uh, get screwed up uh my first stereo 1985 uh Sony, it had AM stereo, which was unheard of until that point. Uh, and then I got the Walkman, which was had mega bass so that you could really, really hammer out that bass through your ears. Um, we were talking about it earlier, uh, or yesterday. Uh, I didn't realize this until this past weekend, but that computer is exactly the computer that I had. It had an external CD-ROM drive, and uh, I found out that it was $7,000 in 1995. Uh, it was great. It was a 486 with a math coprocessor, and I could do AutoCAD on it. Um, and then around the same time, I got my first cell phone. So I, I, I think I've been probably, for for my cohort, I was adopting technology a little bit faster than, than others in my cohort. Any comments from Laura or Ted? So... What, explain the whole Walkman FM AM in the bottom right. I mean, uh, uh, what what's going on with that? Did you really you know walk around with that? You know, did you have a like butt pack? I mean, how did that work? Yeah, no, I I attached it to my belt. I was the coolest guy in town, Ted. It uh, uh-huh. it, had a, it also had AM stereo and fancy things like auto reverse and preset uh, tuning. It was extremely high end. Um. And I I bought it at a it was almost a precursor to an Amazon where you'd go in and you'd fill out a piece of paper and they'd go into the warehouse and then they'd bring it back for you. Hmm, interesting. Mm-hmm. Move on to uh, Gen Y and Laura. Yes. So following Gen X and the Walkman came us millennials and the Discman, the digital generation. We grew up listening to CDs and MP3s. The World Wide Web entered mainstream America in our early childhood years. We enjoyed Disney and Nickelodeon. We had our first Nokia cell phones in high school, and most of us can remember MySpace. Then came the iPod and the iPhone. We've learned to embrace technology with hands-on curiosity. We've always been encouraged to jump right in and discover. We look forward to the newest devices and latest products. That being said, we'll soon be the old kids on the block. Gen Z is making their way to the world of FM, and it's likely that we'll look to our young colleagues to help us innovate and improve. So when you got a page, what would you do? Ah, we would find our way to this really archaic machine called a payphone. (laughs) (laughs) And then we would call collect. Of course, yes. You want to make sure you put that burden onto your friends and family. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think I had every one of those items. Um, I had a I had a Discman that actually did more than my rack mounted CD player. It had uh, I could make playlists on the Discman itself, and uh, it had something that looked like a calculator on the top, which was pretty fancy for its day. Sounds like, sounds like. Um, you know, I think um, we've all got different perspectives. I think, you know, I think Laura, well put, you know, you, you, from a generational perspective, um, you know, adopting inquisitive and good point. We've got, um, you know, uh, even 
more fully integrated to the you know web and tech as as just you know standard coming into the workplace now. Um, so, Jeff, you want to take kind of point on you know the kind of initial part for um, stakeholder facing technologies. Yeah, so I, I think that the the reality is is that technology is invasive in FM, and there's really no way to get around it. Um, but uh, we've got all of these different things facing our stakeholders and recognizing that we've got stakeholders that are coming from different generations and their comfort levels are going to be different. So the, the media and method of delivery could be different. Imagine your maintenance management, your IWMS. Uh, not only do you have different stakeholder roles in what you're asking them to do inside of that, but you're also asking them to ingest information in different ways and understanding in some cases, um, those are going to be barriers to adoption um, and understanding those different elements. Um, one of the things that we found uh, very interesting in, in a business that I was working in is that the catering element um, and, and the room reservation were tied together and really streamlining that to make a cohesive customer-facing uh, tool set uh, that allowed you to really be predictive and, and customer relationship management and all those things. It took a lot of effort to find a tool that could be almost uniformly rolled out to multi-generation. Uh, there was a huge group of people that you had to work to figure out how to get them to stop phoning because it was actually easier to use the tech. Didn't want to bar them from phoning to, to phone in their order, but wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity that matched their interests or uh, acceptance. Um, I get into some of the other things where we're talking about artificial intelligence and analytics and IoT being really pervasive. And and if you if you think that there isn't IoT in your business. Um, I think that's probably in most cases erroneous because people are bringing IoT devices to work with them. Uh, and so you look at Google, um, Google Maps and how it does traffic. They are tracking phones and understanding where things are and how fast things are moving. So there are IoT devices everywhere. Uh, they're not necessarily being used for facility management, but they're coming into your business. Artificial intelligence is something that's really, really going to change the shape of the businesses that we function in uh, because there are tasks that will become obsolete inside organizations because a computer can do them just as well as a person can. Uh, if you go on uh, online and read some of the Associated Press articles, what you'll find is that a lot of times they're being computer generated as composites of other articles or news feeds. Ted or Laura, would you have anything to add to that? Wonderful. Sure. Sure. <laughs> uh, I absolutely will. Um, you know, the uh, integration of AI and analytics is, is, you know, I think where we're seeing some, you know, incredible advances, especially in the last uh, two years. Uh, we look at what uh, IBM's done with Watson and how they've managed to provide an agnostic tool set into any other tech environment uh, with not just, you know, off the shelf great analytical capabilities and great graphing, but with the AI behind it to once it starts learning uh, what you're actually asking for, it'll start saying, had you thought about this, maybe you should look at it like that is... Uh, you know, I think really, you know, something we should, as a, from an industry perspective, not be shy about taking advantage of. Um, and besides uh, Watson, there's, you know, uh, another, you know, group of, you know, excellent tools out there. But, um, you know, I've been made a, a very conscious decision, for example, to make it incredibly affordable. Um, so, you know, no matter what your challenges are, you know, whether it's how to, you um, you know, look at optimizing, you know, the staff time or vendor time that you have to actually, you know, take care of your preventative maintenance or look at what more you were talking about, Jeff, in terms of uh, customer facing, really more of a shared service, complete one-stop shop, go to the portal, request space, request catering, you know, put in a too hot, too cold call. You know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, I think integrating all into that one customer facing portal and having, 
sort of work centers that you know make sense for the different stakeholders. Um, I think it's the other you know kind of tailoring that we're seeing a lot of the you know tech you know happen you know uh, focusing on that from a development perspective. So if you're a financial analyst or you're um, a scheduler or you're a um, you know field tech, then you've got you know really a view into that same uh, data set, but in context that makes it more relevant to you. What do you think about that, Jeff and Laura? I I think it's actually a good segue to the next slide, actually. Um, so if we were to look at the next slide, I, I think that there's um, – so the context becomes different things, and different things mean different things to different people. And so I think, you know, we've come from a world – uh, or at least I came from a world that, uh, you know, the desktop and laptop were kind of ubiquitous. But the idea of kiosks and, um, you know, smartphones and tablets and, uh, and kind of tablets that are hybrids between tablets and computers and the Surface tablet, all of those different things have a different context and a different user group. Um, the ability for somebody to walk into a building and use a kiosk uh, with no training, no thought behind it, just be able to walk up to something, touch a few buttons, and you're good to go. It's a totally different thing than than having to sort of teach an application and how do you use how to use a piece of equipment. You know, which buttons do I click? Uh, and I think that one of the big big things that I'm really interested in is the idea that um, there there are devices, and given the way Apple has rolled things out in Android. Um, if people are comfortable with them, there's almost no training involved in those uh, those tool sets. We're we're rolling out tool sets that are common across all platforms and all software. So a form based solution is the same whether you're ordering from Amazon or making a request for a work order. Uh, the kind of the clicking and the buttons and everything looks and feels very similar, so that it's something that uh, you can get a broader based comfort level uh, across multiple generations. Uh, you did mention you know, Google, one of the things, um, you know, that they've done with their material design uh, application framework is make it available for everyone. Uh, it, it's not, you know, just a single tool set, you know, in a single ecosystem. It, it crosses all the, uh, you know, primary software platforms and hardware platforms, which I think, you know, really supported a lot of that unification and familiarity with, oh, I know what to do. Uh, I'm, you know, maybe, you know, ordering something from Amazon versus putting a service ticket, but I know what to do. It, it's much more intuitive. Um, when we, we have a question we, coming in. We do? Awesome. We do. From Mr. Mister Reynolds. Um, how does an environment like iOffice Hummingbird, for example, influence our expectations of technology? Ted, I think you're more familiar with iOffice than I am. Um, not that deeply, um, you know, I think if you could expand on that a little bit, I'm not that familiar with Hummingbird, the overall framework of our office. Absolutely. I think, you know, looking at, uh, easy usability is generally the goal, but I'd need a little more specific. Sorry, I'm not that familiar with that specific component. Laura, Jeff. I'm not familiar with iOffice. Um, however, we are actually in the process of implementing Space IQ, which I believe is a similar product. Um, I think for many FMs, we've either inherited or found ourselves trying to um, innovate our paper-driven and obsolete practices um, with technology and connectivity of the 21st century. We have the possibilities to integrate so many different work systems. So Space IQ, for example, allows us the ability to manage our floor plans and our space planning and move management all digitally. And whether I'm at my desk or I'm at home on my laptop, I have access to that. Um, there's a lot of really neat reporting features, um, a lot of data that you have access to that you didn't when you were using your paper floor mats or CAD drawings. Um, as far as our expectations of technology, as a YP, I think we expect that technology will be integrated with all 
functions of facility management? And if they're not, how can they? Um, and also, how can we connect the different types of technology? So how does it feel when you when you walk into an environment, Laura, where you've got this expectation level and and the actual is much different? Ah, that yeah, that happened to me. <laughs> and it's eye-opening. I think for the young generation, they're not they don't realize how how other generations manage facilities. And it's really commendable because we have access to so much technology and data and everything we could possibly need to manage our facilities. Um, so it, it, for us, it's different. We, we walk into a facility and we expect that these softwares and programs and applications will be in place. Um, in a lot of cases, that's not true. And we, as the next generation, come in and try to retrofit and introduce all of the new technology to the facility. I, I think probably the uh, if we go to the next slide, I, I think that it starts to lead into uh, expectations of service levels. Um, and so I think some some people may have heard of the the service your way platform uh, that Disney implemented. But the idea is that one of the values that facility management provides is to really cater to the needs of the, the the people that work in an organization uh so that they're able to be the most healthy and productive that they can be uh which you know drives the bottom line for the organization um i think one of the you know one of the things that we've been really struggling with in fm is how do we get there uh with limited resources and um and so I, I walk into just about any business, and I've probably got a higher level of expectation around, uh, you know, the thought process and the investment in time and energy. And, uh, you know, you walk into a restaurant and they they seat you, and then they wait 20 minutes before they come by. And and uh, or or you go into a restaurant and you see that there are things that are just um, in in the washrooms or in the fit and finish of a of a business that say I don't ever want to come back to this business. It's got nothing to do with the food or the you know or even sometimes the customer service, but the the actual way and how all that package rolls out um, isn't inviting. It isn't something that we we want to get involved in. And I think that uh, we're struggling to. Uh, to find people in our industry right now and retain. And I think that's across all industries. So if we get into a situation where uh, retention becomes an even bigger issue, uh, that hospitality and service your way for building occupants is going to be a, a heavy influencer on retention. Uh, and I think technology starts to drive that in the absence would, of people. Yeah, I would definitely uh, uh, agree, and I think you know one of the questions we asked uh, in Chicago was, you know, can can we afford this with our current budgets, and then how do we um, look at you know making a, a good business case that it's not just um, you know a want, it's actually potentially a need to retain top talent. Um, you know, I think I gave the example at a small issue with my uh, room in uh, Chicago, and, you know, they were, you know, incredibly efficient, uh, you know, did great follow-up, uh, even kind of delivered a couple of bottles of water just to uh, make up for the inconvenience. And I think the reaction from the side in Chicago is, we can't afford that. You know, we don't have the budget for that. And I think we had some, you know, pretty good dialogue on, well, what could we do to be somewhere in the middle? You know, how can we you know, provide that great customer experience given the budgets we've got. So um, I think there's, uh, and beyond that, I think that there's a, a calculation that might be missing. The cost of turnover is so obscene uh, that mm -hmm. an, if if uh, if an investment in facilities would help to reduce uh, attrition, um, maybe we can afford it, or we can afford something in the middle. Yeah. Um, Laura, any thoughts from your perspective? I mean, you, you've got, uh, I think, a, 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 a unique view given that you're working in a, in a nonprofit. Uh, how, how are you seeing that? Yes. So in my facility, um, we're in office space, and we're also a nonprofit. So our customers are our colleagues. Um, and if it's not our colleagues, then it's our guests, which are grant 
grantees and donors. Um, so we have a service first mentality at all times. Um, we recognize ourselves as a service team, not only to our organization, um, but also to the community. We manage a conference center and other public facilities. Um, I'm sorry, Ted, I might have lost track of that question. No, no, I mean, no Jeff, you were right on track in terms of service first, in terms of taking care of your colleagues, your donors, your grantees. I mean, uh, um, but your funding is like, yeah, yeah, and your funding is limited. Yes. Yeah, it is, I, yes. And so we have a tight budget, um, but we're always looking for innovative ideas, and IFMA tends to give us the resources that we need to help us connect with the providers of those resources. And in many cases, if we're, we don't have a budget to take on a full application, we can at least collaborate with other IFMA members um, and implement best practices. Excellent. Uh, Go ahead, Ted, what, uh, there's, there's, I mean, it really depends on the role, but what would you anticipate the cost of turnover to be? Uh, in a kind of a relationship to the cost of a full-time equivalent? Um, from looking at a couple of studies, it's, uh, you know, 35% at least, uh, in some cases 50%, depending on the study. Uh, so if you lose someone that, you know, the round numbers is, you know, uh, $100,000 a year fully loaded resource, your cost to replace is 35 to 50000 plus the replacement cost of the salary. So it's, that, that's what I've seen. Uh, have you seen different data? Yeah, and I think it really depends on the role. I've seen it as low as uh, 20% um, and, and, and as high as uh, 150%. It really depends on um, kind of, I think it depends on how you burden it. Uh, if you assume that it's hard to replace a senior role and you end up burdening existing employees and, and run the risk of burning them out, I think it starts to creep the number up higher. Um, but if you were to look at it differently and say, well, what are the what are the accommodation elements of the business that we could do to encourage people that this is the this is the best place they're ever going to work? Um, you know, you, you spend let's say you spend 20% of, of what you expect your cost of turnover is going to be and invest that back into the business through the facilities or through accommodations or workplace elements. And I think that you you should start to reverse the flow of, of attrition. Good thoughts, and good thoughts. Um, I think the other factor from a human dynamics perspective that you know, our processes and technology, you know, support is in certain environments. Um, the easier we make it to solve the issue, the problem, whether it's, um, you know, taking care of a too hot, too cold call or, you know, dealing with, you know, anything that's, you know, in a, in a larger facility footprint or if you've got distributed facilities in thousands of locations across the country, what's the speed to resolution um, impacts the productivity of the organization as well. Uh, if, you know, I'm being distracted by a noisy um, uh, mechanical unit in the ceiling, I'm, you know, off my game. I'm not, you know, anywhere near 100% uh, efficient in terms of my work day. Um, I, I think that's the other factor of um, what the, the tech and the mindset can actually, do, you know, for the human dynamics. Certainly. Um, so David had a uh, comment, and I think it probably relates, I'm interpreting it, but I think it probably relates to our next slide. So um, the idea that data is consumed differently is a really important aspect. Uh, in most cases, um, there's not a lot of value in raw data. Um, an analyst or, or a report needs to be structured to create value out of that data. Uh, I think what we need to understand as an FM is that, yeah, we, to Laura's point earlier, we can actually pull a lot of data and get a lot of 
measurable uh, influences on how we do things. But that really does need to be considered in the repackaging to present to top management in the organization. And so that is one of our challenges with technology is we're, we're actually able to get far more data um, than we can use and we need to be able to separate the, uh, the noise out and then we need to refine it to become uh, the underpinning of a business case or the, uh, the metric that we use for a KPI or, or those types of things. Um, and I believe that's where David was going with the comment. Ted and Laura? Was a, um, ladies first. Ladies first. Um, yeah, I mean, that's very relevant in our, and it's probably in most organizations, if you're looking for budget considerations and you're not able to present the strategic priority or influence of the project or the application, um, it's likely that you're not going to get the investment from leadership. We would totally, you know, agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, looking at from a strategic perspective, you know, where we're, uh, how to articulate that we're really nothing without um, how our people are working in, in teams and across, you know, multiple teams and across multiple geographies and in many instances, is, you know, without that, that people-oriented focus to support what we're suggesting from a change perspective, I think it kind of falls on deaf ears. I think there's sufficient uh, backup data, uh, survey data, white paper data to support now, and I'm not sure there really was as, you know, as well-defined um, sets of uh, trending data that you know could be utilized to help make that business case and say, hey, wait a minute, we're not just the guys that you know doing the water, power, and air and keeping the space clean. You know, there's a little bit more to it um, if you really think about it. And I think you know our approaches uh, from the FM perspective have to change uh, in order to you know get effective results and hopefully a little more budget to uh, you know give that uh, kind of world class service delivery. Do you think that um, as these tools become more ubiquitous, um, that they're going to be just an expected uh, expected element, and that there's going to be, uh, you know, you don't think about needing a pen or a pencil, you don't think about having a technology, and from that perspective, it, it becomes foundational value, but not delivering kind of an increased value to the organization. Sure, absolutely, especially um, for us YPs. Um, you know, you get accustomed to the technology that's in place. It's just a part of your everyday operations and routine. Um, I think I think that the big challenge for FMs is going to be able to, from the back end, take all the data that you're grabbing and then turning it into metrics that you can then share with leadership and hopefully with the entire organization to show the value that you're adding from a strategic perspective. I think uh, that's one of those fun. things being reducing, reducing risk potentially for errors and emissions or retention or loss of um, loss of life or whatever it ends up being. Both things I think are, are spot on. I mean, I think you know, looking at you know some of the uh, you know more complex uh, environments where the people are more readily to invest. Uh, you know, looking at shopping centers and airports and um, public venues, uh, the expectations are, are pretty darn high these days. Um, you know, and, and you, you, it doesn't really matter. Well. You can be in any major airport in the world and function without, you know, any direction whatsoever other than, you know, just keeping an eye out. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, what can we legitimately budget um, if we're in a, you know, 100,000 square foot office building. Um, it's, a, you know, a little harder to quantify, but I think, you know, all the same um, expectations are kind of there when the people walk in the door because they're used to. Uh, higher levels of service in other places that they've been during the week of the month. Um, just 
watching the time, and we're coming up on five minutes remaining. Josh, have we gotten any questions? No, not other than the ones from David. If you do have any questions, please feel free and type them into the question box, and we'll be happy to present them. Okay. So um, while we're waiting to see that, we'll kind of roll through the, the next uh, the next slide. And I, we've done entire presentations on just this element, but I think the idea is to really, when you get down to it, we're talking about an element of a solution. So when we when we did this presentation uh, in Chicago, uh, the conversation around the room actually was a lot about change management and managing the change that technology would bring with it. Um, mapping the needs of the tool uh, to the business uh, from a business case perspective, and then mapping your business process, which in some cases has maybe never been done, comparing it to best practices and understanding what um, you know what you're trying to do and making sure that you're actually automated the, automating the right process um, and then you get into sort of evaluating the tools uh, looking at the the medium that the tool is going to deliver through so is it handheld is it tablet is it computer um, is it purely web based is it client server based uh, and then looking at your implementation cycle trying to understand uh, you know how you can get into continuous improvement and really understanding the life cycle of the technology so that you can budget for technology because it is just like anything else it has a life cycle it does get antiquated and it does need to be replaced uh, Laura and Ted I think you know looking at it from a perspective uh, we have digital real estate and digital assets we have to manage um, you know did a presentation you know from that perspective at fusion in Los Angeles uh, a number of years ago and it was kind of a different way of thinking uh, but if we from a operation perspective look at hey you know we have a physical building envelope we have all these assets we have you know this particular you know set of resources to uh, maintain the assets and support the, the facility occupants we, if we you know kind of shift our view just a little bit uh, really what we're talking about from the, the technology side is you know the corresponding set of technologies and looking at them as you know not much different than a chiller they, they you know need maintenance they need um, you know a, a replacement plan at a certain point in time yeah I mean there are um, there are tools that are out there in the marketplace that are web enabled but they are built on very very old client server server technology and old database structures and all of that legacy stuff is threaded through the database and it makes them inefficient and inflexible to whatever's coming next it takes a lot of effort to uh, write those ships um i totally agree and i think you know one of the things we need to ask you know whenever we're looking at uh you know acquiring technology for our, our, our facilities our operations our business is what's the underlying structure look like um you know do we have you know um a current generation database platform you know uh, soft layers in between in terms of communication protocols that are safe uh and not you know we get totally hung up on you know what you see on the front as you described jeff it's really you know what's powering that because you might find that you know even though it looks great in a browser what what's under the hood is pretty antiquated uh and that will you know, almost certainly uh, tell you that if it if it is older technology uh, under, underlying that you're going to have to plan for a you know a replacement because it's going to be very difficult to uh, maintain for the long term. I think a kind of an anecdotal uh, description of that is I've been to Cuba on vacation a few times because it's something that Canadians have been allowed to do uh, for years, and uh, you go and they've got all of these. Uh, mid 60s and, and 50s cars that look shiny and new they look like they've just rolled off the assembly line out of Detroit and you open the hood and you find a Cold War era uh, Lada motor and a bunch of Russian tech that uh, really was never good when it was new 
uh, and it's being used to hold that thing together. Yeah. Good way of putting it. Good way of putting it. Um, yeah, just said, you know, we've got a, a complete presentation just on developing a flexible FM uh, technology strategy. If anyone's interested in that, I think uh, we posted it to the knowledge library. And I think the, you know, to kind of wrap up, I know we're really at time, um, you know, looking at, you know, uh, steps to success, you know, we've got a, a, an equivalent uh, presentation that we put together um, on that as well. And I think that's also in the uh, uh, knowledge library, if I'm correct. Um, because you know, you know, there's 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 a lot to think about with this stuff. It's not just you know, can I do a work order? But there are a lot of implications that we should be considering. You know, overall. A um, couple of wrap up thoughts. Uh, again, GDPR is coming, um, and although uh, you know, it, it's a you know, really European Union uh, mandate uh, right now. It's already affecting what's happening in the rest of the world because there's so many multinationals. They have to comply in one segment of the world. They have to comply everywhere. Um, that is going to affect something as simple as if you accept a uh, work order ticket through a web interface, how are you treating that data? So this is affecting you know, how we deal with facility management. Um, it, it's definitely going to come. You know, looking at, uh, you know, some of the things we've talked about today, you know, uh, what what's the corporate culture and how do we impact that? What, how do we take in, you know, into account our generational differences? Uh, yes, Jeff, I think you said people still want to pick up the phone. Great. Other people don't want to pick up the phone. They just want to use their app on the phone. And, uh, you know, the uh, level of threat on a daily basis uh, with, you know, malware, malicious intent, phishing, um, is, is pretty significant. So on the one hand, we've got all these great new web-based tools, but on the other, we really need to think about uh, you know, the security aspects of what we're doing as well. Certainly. Well, I think we're at time. Um, I think we thank are. Thank everyone for attending. Uh, it was great chatting with uh, Ted and Laura again today, and thank you, Josh, for putting it together, and David for organizing. Great. I thank you all for a great presentation, and thank you for celebrating World FM Day with us. Everyone, you have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye now.